If I come out from having spoken this evening with a sunburn, you'll know what happened. <laughs> the light's pretty bright up here. I appreciate being able to be here and speak to you once again. It's been several months since I've been able to do so, and I really appreciate the prayers and consideration that uh, has been offered to me during my period of sickness. It's not over yet, but we've, I feel like we've gotten the worst of it behind us, and that's, that's encouraging. When you go through 40 treatments of radiation, it gets old very quickly, and I appreciate your interest in my behalf. Tonight, as we talk about the lesson that I have planned, I'm going to be talking about growing as a Christian, or you could just say Christian growth, and it would be the same thing. In the past several months, since we've begun our visitation program on a more concentrated effort than we were before, we've seen some results from this, and I'm encouraged by it, and I hope you are too. Uh, we can't give up on it. We've got to keep moving forward, and hopefully uh, we can overcome the efforts of some to uh, cause us difficulty in that respect. But as we think about the newborn babes in Christ that have been converted in the past several months, and some have been restored to the faith, it's encouraging, and we need to make sure that we keep those individuals growing as they should. And that's one of the reasons I decided on preaching this particular lesson tonight is to encourage each of us to help one another. Because as we grow in the Christian life, it's a, it's a matter of growing from the very beginning on clear to the time that we pass away from this life. And all of us need to be growing as the scriptures indicate that we should. And hopefully I can uh, emphasize some of the things tonight that will help us to do that. Why is it that some people uh, having been converted, uh, fall away within a short time. And another question, just as, as discouraging, is why is it that we sometimes see people that have been Christians for 40 or 50 years, and then within uh, a short time before their death, they fall away from the faith? This shouldn't happen. And we need to make every effort that we can to correct this. In 2 Peter 3 and verse 18, we see that we are told to grow in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be glory forever and ever. Amen. So, as we think about that particular text, dealing with the subject matter tonight, I think the first thing we need to consider is some of the basics. What is a Christian, for example? How would you define a Christian? Well, first of all, it's one who has obeyed the gospel. And as you see the teaching in the New Testament in regard to the gospel, keep in mind passages such as John 3 and verse 5, where Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. So, as Nicodemus was talking to Jesus, Nicodemus was given the answer to his question. What, it, what is necessary for a man to be able to enter the kingdom of God? And Jesus gave him that answer. He must be born of water and of the Spirit. As we look further, we see passages that help us to realize what it takes to obey the gospel when we see passages like Mark 16, verses 15 and 16, where Jesus said unto them to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Again in Acts 2 and verse 38, on that occasion on the day of Pentecost, the question was raised by those individuals who had actually been 
involved with the crucifixion of the Christ. They realized they had crucified the Son of God. And they said, what must we do? What did Peter answer? He said, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ. Why? For the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So, having seen the basics, some of the basics, as far as what it takes to become a Christian, then let's realize that when one is first obedient to the gospel, he's very similar from a spiritual standpoint to the individual who is just born into this world physically and the first that you see that individual may be in the nursery at the hospital. Very few in uh, infants are born at home in this country nowadays, but uh, in the hospital you'll see these little tiny babies. You just can't imagine how, how they can exist with those tiny fingers and tiny toes and, and you mothers I'm sure uh, have much more concern about them than uh, we men do for the most part. But each of us need to realize that one that's just been converted or been obedient to the gospel of Christ is very similar from a spiritual standpoint to the individual that's in that nursery in the little crib there and the nurses are tending to him throughout the day. We'll try to emphasize some of those things as we look at this material tonight. In 1 Peter uh, chapter 1, verses 23 through chapter 2 and verse 2, we see there that Peter is making a statement, and I'll summarize it rather than go through the reading of all those verses. He says that having been born again as newborn babes, we are to desire the sincere milk of the word, that you may grow thereby. As we look at the figures of speech that are given in regard to a spiritual baby, we want to make some comparisons with the physical as we mature in this physical life from childhood right on through to the time that we depart from this world. We look at a newborn baby, for example, helpless. They couldn't exist without assistance from those of us outside of their realm of capability. I recall having listened to the radio uh, on my way home from work back several years ago when I was working for the state and there was a man on there that was talking about uh, primarily the subject of abortion and he says a child not, is not a a living being, not a, a true being, until he's capable of, of taking care of himself and therefore he has to be born into this life because it takes that point at which he becomes a living being and capable of taking care of himself. I assure you that man never took care of a baby or he wouldn't have made statements like that because that baby is about as helpless as you can get and without help from the mother and father both and maybe some of the children as well, he won't make it. And so as we consider this tonight, we'll be talking about the baby's growth from infancy to maturity in comparison with that. Let's look at some things that are required for growth. For example, the first one I want to talk about is proper growth requires food. Every one of us recognize that on a daily basis. And some of us recognize it um, to a greater extent than we should. I know my wife and I keep checking that scale and say, he can't be true. <laughs> and uh, they'll, I'll look around and see if she's got her toe on the, on the scale, but it's not. And so we have to watch those things. We have to have the right food, not just any food, but the right food. Take, for example, in the case of a physical child just born into this world. Do you expect him to eat steak and potatoes? Or maybe, uh, as the teenagers love it, hamburger and french fries and pizza and all that good stuff. You're going to feed the baby that kind of food? Can't take it. 
And consequently, we can't take it as a spiritual babe in Christ either. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 23 and following, again, the same thought is that we must grow, thereby having the sincere milk of the word. The Hebrew writer expressed it in a different way, slightly, in chapter 5, beginning in verse 12 and on through for verse 14. If you have your Bibles, you can turn with me. I'll read the passage and you can follow. He says, For when the, for the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk, and not of strong meat. For every one that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. So, we recognize that in our physical growth from very birth onward, we must have that milk and have it for a period of time. It's not just a month or so, it's a period of months before our children are transferred over to that solid food whereby they grow and enable them, they're enabled to process that food within their bodies. As we talk about food and the right food, what is good for a child is not always what they want. I can recall when I was a child, I, I loved ice cream, I loved most anything that was sweet, and yet what does that do for you if you continue that way all of your life? Those of you that suffer from a degree of diabetes know what sugars can do to you, for example. Lee Hammock I was talking with just a few days ago, and he is suffering severely from a case of diabetes, and he would give most anything to be able to get rid of that, and yet it's something that, unless we're careful, throughout our childhood, it may lead us into that in later life. So, even though our children may want candy and ice cream, as parents we know that's not best for them. And the same thing is true, spiritually speaking. I know when I first began preaching, after having been through a preacher training school, the first place that I went to, the adult class was studying and they wanted me to teach the class. And guess what they were studying? Revelation. Um, and so we studied through Revelation in that class. A few years later I moved on down to Florida, uh, having lived there before and over in the area of Orlando. And as I arrived at that location, I began working for the state as an auditor as I had in prior years, but I wanted to preach as well. And consequently then, I began to look around somewhat like Tim Koza did recently. I wanted to find a place where they had need for a preacher, and as the state law read at that time at least, I couldn't work in two jobs at the same time and get paid for both of them. And so I decided that working for the state would be a vocation which would provide food on the table for my family, but at the same time I could still preach for a congregation that had a need for somebody. And so I found a small congregation close by to where we lived. They had about 20 to 25 people meeting on a regular basis. And so as I look out here tonight, if you can picture having everybody from this side moving over to this side and filling out just the first few pews, that was what it was like to preach to that group. And I, I began to wonder if my neck was going to make it or not, because I kept having to turn this way to view the audience as I was preaching to them. But in that case, it was a matter that those people needed somebody to preach for them. And so I said, I can't accept money from you. And they said, that's all right. 
<laughs> that was no problem to them. But I said, if you'll take that same amount and put it into mission work, I'll be happy and, and you'll be doing some good for the Lord too. And so that's what we did for about three years there before we moved on to another location. As we think not only about the right food, as we've talked about some, but also the right amount of food. The right amount of food is, is just as important because you can't feed a human being twice as much, or a very small child especially. You don't give them twice as much one day and then say, okay, I fed you twice as much yesterday, forget about it until tomorrow. It doesn't work that way, and you know it doesn't. It can't be done that way. The same thing is true with our animals that we have on our farms and places like that. It requires the right amount of food, and if you don't get that right amount of food, you'll end up with malnutrition and your body won't be what it should have been. It requires also not only the right amount, but regular feedings, as you mothers know. If you don't feed that child on a regular basis when it's first born, it's going to let you know. And it'll let you know, unless you're deaf, <laughs> you may wish you were. Because that child's going to let you know when it's hungry. And you better feed it on a regular basis or you'll have problems. So, it is with Christians then, in summary, that every Christian needs to be fed the right food in the right amount and in regular feedings. Let's consider for a few moments now <clears throat> the fact that our proper growth as a Christian requires exercise. Exercise is something all of us require. And one of the problems that we have as we get older and not able to move about as easily as we used to be able to, we don't get as much exercise as we need or require, let's put it that way. I don't think, looking over here at Ray Pierce, uh, I know Ray's got a little problem with the knee, and he wishes that knee would just get like it used to be. But he favors it a little bit, and he doesn't walk as fast as he used to. And I just use Ray as an example. He, we could do that with most any of us in here. Uh, we're not as capable now as we were a few years ago. So, growth requires exercise, but it needs to be the right type of exercise. <clears throat> you ever watch a baby and, and watch them move? They're just constantly moving from one place to another. Their hands are, are swinging in the breeze, their feet are up, and they're looking at them, wondering what those things are. And those are moving back and forth too. I think sometimes we miss the uh, mark. You mothers need to tie some colored ribbons to those toes and they, they get more enjoyment out of them that way. But that's beside the point. Babies are constantly moving. They need that exercise. Of course, exercise needs to be limited as well. You don't expect a baby to play college basketball or soccer or any of those games, that would be ridiculous. They need exercise that would be helpful to them. And that brings us to our next point then, that exercise that they get needs to be in the right amount of exercise. Too much can be harmful to them. And you know as well as I do, some of you that are, are my age or in that general area, if you overdo it on a particular working assignment, physically that is, you pay for it that night and maybe through the night, maybe the next day as well. Those muscles let you know that they were overworked and they need to have some rest to overcome it. Too much can be harmful, too little can be harmful as well. Several years ago, my wife fell on the sidewalk over in Singapore and broke her hip. We got her to the hospital and got a pin put in to help that hip be able to be used again. It was several weeks before she could put weight on it again. And as a result of this, the muscles in that leg be, began to get smaller and smaller. And when the doctor told her finally that she could put her crutches to one side and, and walk wherever she wanted to go, 
She thought to herself, well, I'm glad he finally said that because now I can do what I want to do. Before she got out of the hospital, she was asking me for one of the crutches to be able to use to help her on her way because that, that leg soon let her know that it wasn't used to that treatment and needed to be cared for. So exercise requires regular applications in order for it to be proper. Daily exercise, of course, is the best. And the same thing is true from a spiritual standpoint. Christians need to be exercised in the right ways in regard to what they're capable of doing, to do so in the right amounts and in a regular basis. I think sometimes that we fail in that respect. As Christians ourselves, if we've just been converted, we fail to realize the need for that daily study of God's Word, which enables us to grow as a result of having that proper food on a regular basis and in the right amount, just as we talked about. And this is what, as members of the congregation, all of us need to be working together toward that end to help each other out. I was noticing this morning as the Gallagher's were able to be out again this morning, how difficult it is for Sister Gallagher to get just up from the seat and to where she can use that walker that she uses to get back and forth to the car. And what an extreme effort it is just to move from that walker to sit down on the seat of the car. It's a very difficult thing. I admire those of you that are older and have difficulty moving about to be here on a regular basis. You may not be able to teach classes. You may not be able to go out and do visitation like you'd like to be able to do, but you serve a great example just by being here and people such as I'm relating to you, what I saw just this morning. When you are here, you are teaching by the example that you are setting, that you are concerned about serving God in whatever way you can and just being here may be the only thing, the only way that you can serve it. If so, that's what needs to be done. Let's consider another aspect to growth. Proper growth requires proper care and protection. For example, it doesn't matter whether you're healthy or whether you're not healthy. You still need proper care and uh, protection in order to exist in this life. If you didn't care for a newborn baby, what would happen to him? You don't have to think very long to answer that one. That child could not care for itself. And unlike the uh, animal life around us, I can recall as a young boy seeing a newborn calf get up from the ground and within a matter of minutes it had found its way to its mother and was nursing and getting nutrition. Human children do not have that capability. Without a mother to look after them, they wouldn't make it. Or somebody else obviously could substitute for that. But without care and protection, they wouldn't make it. It requires the proper preventive actions in order for them to make it even then. That's when you're healthy. But when you're not healthy, when you're sick, I'm reminded in talking with uh, Kerry Parks back there, having worked as a nurse, he's very familiar with the problems that exist with those that are physically uh, unable to look after themselves. When you're sick, those around you need to not only expect you to tell when you are sick or what's wrong with you, but those around need to be aware too. Watch for the symptoms of sickness and see if somebody needs help from a physical standpoint, but even more important as a spiritual standpoint. Because if we die spiritually, we've lost the whole point in life, looking toward an opportunity to be with God through eternity. 
So we watch for the symptoms of what's wrong. And if we see a problem, we need to correct it before it becomes serious. We need to get the prescribed medicine that is recommended for it. Not only get the medicine, but take it as prescribed for the proper use. So in summary, in regard to this area, Christians require care and protection. They require care and protection from those who oversee them to help them avoid becoming spiritually sick and to regain their health if they do become spiritually sick. And that's an ongoing problem for every one of us. Watch out for your brother or sister in Christ and help them in whatever way you can. Another area we need to consider is the area that proper growth requires a family that loves one another. It's been shown by studies in this country that those who have a baby that's brought up in a family without parents, without parents, not, I didn't mean to pause there, they all have parents, but without parents that show the proper love for them, they're not going to develop to the extent that they should. They won't develop as well as one that does have the proper love shown by those around him. Love between brothers and sisters physically is important. That's one of the benefits of multiple children in a family. The brothers and sisters help each other to some extent. Of course, it works the other way too sometimes. I recall one of our examples of this. Our older daughter was just a few years old at the time. Our second child was a son and he was very small. Reba had laid him down on a blanket on the uh, floor in the house and she heard something that didn't sound quite right to her. So she went and took a look and sure enough it wasn't quite right. Our daughter Sandra had a spoon, like a tablespoon, and she had found out that every time you bump the child on the head, his eyes blink. <laughs> That's, that's not the proper care. No way. And be careful, as spiritually speaking, that you don't hit somebody on the head with a spiritual spoon just to watch their eyes blink. We need to look out for each other in whatever way we can. Brothers and sisters can provide a great deal of help to one another. It will actually help the parents a great deal if that help can be properly directed. And for a Christian to grow properly, he must feel that he is loved as well. Proper growth also requires accepting correction when needed. And this is something that's very difficult to convince children about. But fathers and mothers who love their children correct them. In Hebrews 12, verses 5 through 11, we see the uh, direction in this regard. If you'll turn your Bibles to that point, in chapter 12, 5 through 11, it says, And, and you, having forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as un, unto children, my son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son, whom he receiveth. If you endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? What would you think about it? A, a child that their parents didn't care enough for them to see that they did do what's right, or try to encourage them to do so. Continuing with verse 8 then, But if you be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. In other words, you're compared with an illegitimate child rather than a son born to the family, as we would expect to have all the rights of a son. Furthermore, we have had fathers in our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For they verily for a few days chastened after their own pleasure, 
but he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. Now, no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness and unto them which are exercised thereby. As you think back on your childhood, I remember my father used to be a barber when I was very tiny. And unfortunately, when he quit barbering, he didn't throw away his razor strap. It uh, was used occasionally. And I can recall times when my backside burned from the application of that strap. Maybe you can think of similar occasions in your life where your parents corrected you. He would probably have been jailed for child abuse under our present status as far as society is concerned. But I still think that the scriptures are right when they say that we are to train up our child in the ways that they should go. And when they're old, they'll not depart from it. And if it takes some physical effort on the part of the parents to do this, then I feel very definitely that that should be done. As we continue on in our lessons, uh, then let's move on to the area where we see that proper growth requires intellectual training. And you say, well, why is that necessary? Think about it. We train our children at home as to what is right or wrong. It takes a matter of years before they're old enough to go to school, as we think of it in our society, and be trained by uh, qualified teachers in the courses that they're studying there. But we send our children to our schools to learn the things necessary to be successful in life. And as they go there, even be, uh, from the beginning, they first learn how to speak, and use correct language. If they don't do that, then they're not going to progress in the studies that come later. They add then to that basic knowledge the such things as subjects of mathematics or uh, science or you could think of any number of other subjects that are taken. But each of these are a period of growth as we move from one point to the next. Similarly, Christians are to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, as we mentioned at the beginning of our lesson, 2 Peter 3 and verse 18. A passage I'd like to call your attention to in this respect is from 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5 through 11, where some people refer to this as the Christian virtues. In writing this material, Peter, through the inspiration of God, said that we should add to our faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity or love. He says if these things be in you and abound, you'll grow thereby and you'll never fall. That's something to work toward then. As a newborn Christian, you have that faith. But it must not stop in its growth at that point. It must continue to grow with these other characteristics that I've just mentioned here. And those characteristics will make it possible for your Christian life to be what God has asked it to be and what will be best for you and best for me. In our lessons thus far, we've talked about the various comparisons and we could go into many more, but that should be sufficient for the hour. Our human babies have many characteristics to those of us that are spiritual babes in Christ. Many of the principles that relate to the care of our physical children are also applicable to the spiritual children of God. Why do some Christians then fail to grow as they should? Basically, it's because they're not properly fed. They're not properly exercised. They're not properly given the care and protection that they need. They're not given the proper love that they require to develop. They're not given the proper correction in some cases. And not given the proper intellectual training to develop 
in the study of God's Word and to apply it correctly. When we apply the principles of God's Word properly, we will grow. And all of us will grow. Depending on our level of maturity, we can grow more than others. It brings us into the point tonight, each of us need to make a decision. Are you a Christian? If not, why not? Why not become a Christian if you are not one already? In John 3 and verse 5, we already called your attention to that in the beginning of the lesson. We also mentioned the passage in Mark 16, 15 and 16, where we see the necessity for faith and obedience to God through the process of baptism for the forgiveness of our sins. We see in Acts 2 and 38, as we've looked to it before, how we are to repent and be baptized for the remission of our sins. And so these are characteristics and things that we must do in order to become a Christian. But are you growing as a Christian should? Each of us here tonight can answer that for ourselves. Think about it. Are you studying God's Word as you need to on a regular basis, the proper amount, in the proper areas? All of these things are important. If you're not studying as you should as a Christian, then why not change tonight? Why not correct that problem and do what you know is right in order that God would find you acceptable when this life is over? If you're subject to the invitation call tonight, as Paul leads us in the invitation song, if you're subject to the invitation, please come. Let us know in what way we can help you.